Hello friends, I'm Dr. Harvinder Singh. Welcome to our fourth video podcast. I'm very excited because this is, this video podcast will be our 200th chapter in our Physician's Guide for Clinical Psychiatry course. And the topic for today's podcast is neuropsychiatric aspect of Lyme disease. We all know the importance of ruling out underlying medical condition and all DSM criteria have this to rule to diagnose any psychiatric condition. And uh, we have a full section in our course and it's titled Managing or ruling out comorbid medical condition and this podcast will be a new chapter edition in this section. So Lyme disease we all know is the most common tick-borne disease in United States. There are three main reasons why I decided to do this topic. First is um, we know early diagnosis of Lyme disease can prevent the complications from Lyme disease, which we'll talk more uh, in the course. And it is known to reduce the mortality and morbidity associated with it. The second reason is for physicians practicing in endemic areas where there is high risk of having Lyme disease, psychiatrists should be aware of Lyme disease as likely contributor of neuropsychiatric illnesses and to have Lyme disease in their differential diagnosis for patients presenting with atypical psychiatric presentations. I work in Pennsylvania, which is one of the endemic state for Lyme disease. We'll talk more about that moving forward. And third reason is for a psychiatrist to know when to refer or collaborate with other specialties, internal medicine, family medicine, infectious disease, if indicated. And um, I did extensive literature review for last one week on this topic. I have reviewed guidelines given by AAFP American Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, I also reviewed most recent clinical practice guideline uh, written by Infectious Disease Society of America. I will be talking about this more in the course. Uh, it's called IDSA. And there are total 12 references. Below this video, you can see there is a reference section with all 12 references with either PubMed reference given or a full PDF article reference given. Please do read them. So in the end, after you have finished this full podcast, please post your experiences below, your clinical experience, how you deal uh, with Lyme disease. If you agree or disagree, I would love to hear and learn from you all also. So let's begin this topic. Let's begin our discussion on this topic, which is neuropsychiatric aspects of Lyme disease. There are many tick-borne diseases and Lyme disease is the most common tick-borne illness in United States. The other well-known tick-borne diseases are Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Ehrlichiosis, Tularemia, Babesiosis, but this topic we will only focus on Lyme disease. And I will try to cover these eight topics in Lyme disease, which are the demographics and high risk areas, clinical features, what screening questions to ask for in patients you suspect to have Lyme disease, 
How to diagnose Lyme disease? Neuropsychiatric symptoms associated with Lyme disease? And treatment for Lyme disease? What are the common psychiatric comorbidities or symptoms associated with Lyme disease? And last is what not to do with Lyme disease in terms of treatment. So let's start with basic demographic information about Lyme disease. We all know that Lyme disease is caused by this bacterium Borrelia burgdorferi and it is transmitted by this deer tick Ixodus scapularis. But more important than knowing these names is where is this more common? Which states in United States we, we should be more cautious about? So here is a map and I place those red stars in states where there is high risk of having this illness. And as I already stated before, for physicians working in these endemic states and areas should be mindful of having a Lyme disease in their differential diagnosis for atypical presentation. As you can see, most of the Northeast and um, some, some parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin are considered high-risk states to have Lyme disease. And um, it's mostly seen in both uh, sexes, primarily in males. There are two peak ages, 5 to 9 and 55 to 59. And the time of the year uh, where more cases are seen are late spring and summer months. And the, risk, the main reason why this time is more um, high is most people spend their time outdoors during these months of the year. But be mindful, cases have been reported throughout the years and all ages are affected and both genders are affected. So let's start with the clinical features of Lyme disease or how does Lyme disease symptoms happen in terms of timeline and uh, systemic involvement. Okay, let's start. So here is our deer tick. It get attached to humans and tick starts feeding. With time, it gets engorged and start transmitting the bacterium. But here is an important thing. The bacterium has to be attached to human for at least 36 to 48 hour. The reason this timing is important is uh, the data have shown us that this bacterium is actually present in the mid gut of the tick. And it takes almost 36 to 48 hour for this bacterium to migrate from mid gut to the salivary gland and then when tick is attached for 36 to 48 hour it discharges this bacterium in its saliva into the bite wound so one of the important factors um, to consider when assessing the risk of transmission is how long the tick is attached and usually minimum 36 hours is needed. The second factor to consider is if the tick is engorged or not. And the guidelines have shown us that removal of ticks within 24 hours of attachment can usually prevent the risk of having Lyme disease. So this timeline is very important in clinical feature or risk of having a Lyme disease with 
tick bites. So once tick is there for 36 to 48 hour and the bacterium is transmitted, the first thing that happened is, or I will say, there are three well-recognized clinical stages of Lyme disease. First is early localized Lyme disease. We'll talk about that. After some time, it's early disseminated Lyme disease. And last is late Lyme disease. We'll start with early localized Lyme disease. What happens during initial stages of Lyme disease? The first and most important characteristic sign is having a rash. And this rash is called erythema migraines rash. It can happen very early, within three days to 30 days after exposure. And studies have shown that close to 60 to 80% of patients can develop this characteristic rash. But the important thing is this rash can be easily confused with other conditions. So I will recommend to review the rash picture on a CDC website. They have many good pictures of this rash. I cannot post this here because of the copyright issue, but physicians should be familiar with this rash. And uh, mostly it's a uniform erythematous oval or circular rash with a median diameter of 16 centimeter. The range is from five to 70 centimeters. And CDC defines this rash as expanding red macule or papule that can reach at least five centimeter in size. And they say it can happen with or without central clearing. So with, this is what the bull's eye rash is. There is a central clearing in most cases, so we call it bull's eye because it looks like a bull's eye, but it can happen even without central clearing also. And they say close to 20% of the rash are bull's eye, so 80% is not bull's eye. Mostly we see single rash, but close to 10 to 20% can be multiple rashes. And so this is the first sign in early localized Lyme disease, which is erythema migraines rash. The other things, other symptoms that can happen are viral-like symptoms, which are very non-specific symptoms like having a fatigue, malaise, fever, chills, myalgia, and headaches. These are the two important signs to look for in early localized Lyme disease. After this, the next stage or phase of Lyme disease is early disseminated Lyme disease. Um, these later manifestation of Lyme disease are primarily due to the spread of these spirochetes either under the skin or via bloodstream or lymphatic system to different organ system. And the three main organ system involved here are brain, heart, and joints. I will say skin also, musculoskeletal. And I will not go into details of these different system, but I will briefly summarize them because they are actually a lecture in itself if I go into each of them. Our goal is to focus on the neuropsychiatric aspect of Lyme disease. But before we go into that, let me touch very briefly these uh, organ system involved with Lyme disease. Starting with the dermatologic um, musculoskeletal system, um, these are most commonly involved in the early disseminated phase and the late phase of Lyme disease. Common manifestation are having arthralgia or myalgia and can include joint swelling also. And in cardiac involvement, it can also happen, although not that common compared to the musculoskeletal system involvement, but a patient can have Lyme carditis, can happen in one to two months period after infection, 
and symptoms are very um, not very specific patient can have a chest pain dyspnea on exertion fatigue palpitation and other symptoms and then the neurological symptoms can happen and the symptoms can vary from having a lymphocytic meningitis cranial nerve involvement primarily it's unilateral cranial nerve involvement rather than bilateral and facial nerve is most common nerve involvement here which is cranial nerve 7 it can have motor or sensory involvement and cerebellar ataxia or myelitis patient can present with altered mental status having a headache neck pain neck stiffness and it can progress to late phase of Lyme disease in late phase primarily it involves the arthritis and neurological symptoms arthritis is um, it can happen in actually 60 percent of untreated Lyme disease patient and uh, patient typically present after six months of infection with joint swelling joint pain and uh, it primarily involves knees and hip arthritis and uh, but our main focus will be the neurological finding neurological symptoms with that later on i will also talk about this condition called post lyme disease syndrome which is also called chronic lyme disease syndrome this involves both the arthritis and neurological symptom but other distinct symptoms also with them we'll talk about them briefly moving forward but this is the slide that is a main overview of clinical features associated with Lyme disease early localized early disseminated and late Lyme disease now let's discuss very briefly how is Lyme disease symptoms that we just talked about different in United States versus Europe? The causative agent in United States is Borrelia burgdorferi, whereas in Europe it's different. Erythema migraines, the rash that we talked about, is common in United States, very rare in Europe. And uh, this Lyme neuroborreliosis, what is that? Well, it's a term that we use when neurological symptoms are present with Lyme disease. It's called Lyme neuroborreliosis. Where is it more common? Interestingly, it's more common in Europe. More than 35% patients report neurological symptoms, but in United States, less than 10% report. Painful radiculitis is common in Europe, not that common in United States. But United States have more meningitis and Lyme arthritis compared to Europe. So I will just briefly summarize this again here. In United States, erythema migraines, meningitis, and Lyme arthritis is more common compared to Europe and Europe have more of a Lyme neuroborreliosis and painful radiculitis. This was actually shown in this article published in Lancet in 2007. Please see the references below. There's a link. Click on it. You can read this article if interested, but very interesting. So I just uh, included this here. Moving forward. To our next section is screening so what screening questions to ask when you suspect a person having a Lyme disease or just to rule out if Lyme disease is a possibility in your differential or not first question is what we just talked about if a patient lives in a high-risk area remember that United States map that I showed you before or if a patient recently went for a vacation in these high-risk area, that's number one. Number two. Number two is if a patient 
had a recent or a past history of a tick bite with the flu-like viral illness and or the bull's eye rash, erythema migraines rash that we talked about. That's number two. Number three question is asking patient if patient recently had a health decline followed by a fluctuating progression and the person developing multi-systemic symptoms and to look for cardiac, musculoskeletal, and neurological symptoms. And last thing is very interesting I found in this article, which is this, asking patient if antibiotics initially caused worsening, but then it was followed by improvement in your symptoms. So these are the four questions to ask for when you are screening a patient for having a Lyme's disease. So you have done all this, how will you diagnose somebody with Lyme disease? So this is what we need. History and diagnostic test are needed for, for you to diagnose somebody with Lyme disease. So here is a tick bite and a person developed rash. So clinical diagnosis is straightforward in somebody like this. Somebody who have history, they found the tick, and there's a rash, there's your diagnosis. And the, some authorities say that for early Lyme, you don't need to test, you can treat them directly here. But let's say you're not certain, tick is not present, rash is not consistent, tick bite, history is not there which is actually common in many patients, they don't remember, or they just visited some high-risk area. So you go to serology in these cases. Um, so uh, the CDC and IDSA, which is Infectious Diseases Society of America, recommend serology as a preferred initial diagnostic test. And CDC recommended two-step protocol here which is first doing ELISA, which is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay initially. And if this result, if the results are positive here, then you can do confirmatory Western blot test. And there are IgG and IgM um, Western blots here. And they also say if sign or symptoms are present for less than or equal to 30 days, then you can do both IgG and IgM Western blot. But if the signs or symptoms are present for more than 30 days, they recommend only doing IgG Western blot in that. And also, IDSA uh, recommends PCR, polymerase chain reaction testing, as an option, they're not recommending to do, but as an option for selected patients with late Lyme arthritis or neurological Lyme disease. So mostly for late Lyme disease. I just wanna spend some time here on the serological testing. Physicians should understand that there can be false positive and false negative results with serology. Like IgM and IgG produced in response to Borrelia burgdorferi may even persist for years following a full anti antibacterial treatment. And these persistently elevated levels are not indication of ineffective treatment or even chronic infection. So just relying on these tests afterwards can be risky. Physicians should be cautious. And um, one article actually said it very nicely that care must be taken in eliminating negative test results early because rash may even appear before serological conversion has occurred. And also they say that antibodies may remain long after acute infection has resolved. By long, they said even months or years. So the authorities or most recent guidelines says 
that repeated serological testing for documentation of treatment effectiveness is not recommended. You cannot use this testing moving forward to confirm that person is treated because these antibodies can persist longer. There are many sensitivity and specificity issues with this. But very briefly, this is what this is how the diagnosis is made for Lyme disease. History and serological testing. There is no role of structural neuroimaging yet in Lyme disease. I was not able to find any study consistently showing similar findings, but there are many studies being done in this area. Now, let's talk about the neuropsychiatric symptoms associated with Lyme disease. Before I go there, let me briefly touch one topic here. Like there are three types of infection causing neuropsych symptoms in Lyme disease. First is the meningovascular form, which causes infarcts. Second is CNS infection, infection inside, causing at cortical atrophy, gliosis, and dementia. And last is infection outside CNS. This can also contribute to neuropsychiatric symptoms. Now let's see what neuropsychiatric symptoms can you see. And uh, I actually looked at many, many studies to see if I can find more details about each neuropsychiatric symptoms but I was not able to find more details or individual studies on that. So I will just name these symptoms and talk very briefly about them here. Major depression was the first one that I found. And um, depressive states among patients with late Lyme disease was fairly common. And uh, it actually ranged from 25 to 65% in some studies. And one study said that depression risk is high if Lyme disease is not diagnosed on time or not treated early. And some studies showed increased risk of having suicidal thinking and sometimes homicidality in certain patients. And uh, the other neuropsychiatric symptoms seen or reported in literature are having a psychotic symptoms, paranoia, schizophrenia, dementia was noted, bipolar disorder was reported, and one study shows more likelihood of having a rapid cycling bipolar with Lyme disease. Then anxiety symptoms, panic attacks, anorexia nervosa, and obsessive compulsive disorder was seen. But more important than that, which I found more interesting was this. And I have seen these symptoms in few of my patients. The effect on the cognitive aspect, cognitive symptoms. Primarily, person having poor attention span, poor short-term memory, slow processing, executive dysfunction issue poor time management. And I will talk about these very soon again. So this is there, especially in the chronic, in the late Lyme disease phase. The other symptoms seen are person with sensory hypersensitivity, causing person to feel overwhelmed, easily frustrated, low frustration tolerance, thereby having more irritability and anger in certain patients. Symptoms like depersonalization and intrusive images and thoughts like we see in persons with PTSD. Musical hallucinations were reported also and mood swings and impulsivity. And more important was person with sleep issue having non-restorative sleep. So these are the symptoms. So you can see that it's almost, it touches almost every symptoms that we see with psychiatric disorders. Now, talking about this 
condition called post Lyme disease syndrome. The other term is post treatment chronic Lyme disease or chronic Lyme disease. This is a very controversial topic I felt when I was reading the literature on this. There was no well accepted definition about this. Um, many articles say this means there are many unexplained chronic symptoms. Um, some articles say there is the, the de there is no thing like chronic Lyme disease. But I found this definition uh, by ISDA and they say chronic Lyme disease is onset of any of the following three symptoms which I will talk about onset of any of the following symptoms within six months of Lyme disease diagnosis and persistence of these symptoms or relapsing of these symptoms for more than six months after a person have completed antibiotic treatment. And these three symptoms are presence of fatigue, widespread musculoskeletal pain, and cognitive difficulties. I have seen mostly we encounter in psychiatry person struggling with cognitive difficulty and then you can when you do a full review of system you can find these other two symptoms also in selective patient and what cognitive difficulties are patients mostly encountering these are what we just talked about decreased memory primarily short-term memory poor concentration, difficulty formulating ideas, and difficulty with word finding. Okay. Now, let's move on to our next section, which is treatment of Lyme disease. I will not initiate this treatment alone, but here I will begin referral process to internal medicine, family medicine, infectious disease if needed, and I will work in collaboration with the specialist here, internal medicine, family medicine, infectious disease. But I'm just summarizing the treatment here. It's more detailed and I will not go into that. But knowing what the treatment is will definitely help you when you see these patients as follow up. And the treatment is um, the clinical practice guideline by Infectious Disease Society of America recommends a single dose of doxycycline, which is 200 milligram in adults and 4 milligram per kilogram in kids, children's more than 8 year age. So they recommend you can give a single dose of doxycycline, doxycycline only when all of these following four criterias are met. And these four criterias are First, we already talked about this. Ticks should be reliably identified and attached for minimum 36 hours. We talked about the reason for this. Second is a prophylaxis can be started if a tick is removed within 72 hours. Third, if a person is in an area where the local rate of infection is more than 20%, and these are the areas we talked about, the U United States map that I showed you before. And last is there is no contraindication for doxycycline use. The main contraindication are pregnancy and children less than eight year age. I just wanna spend some time on the time limit again, the 72 hour for prophylaxis treatment. The time limit of 72 hour is suggested because there is an absence of data on the efficacy of this prophylaxis after 72 hours. So that's where this number came from. So knowing this will definitely help clinically speaking when you collaborate with other physicians or when you refer these patients if indicated. Now, what is the treatment for late neurological Lyme disease in the late phase? Because I have seen mostly in psychiatry when you are following patients, um, most of them falls in the late phase. They might have this history in past and you are seeing them for these symptoms, neurological symptom, neuropsychiatric symptom that we talked about. 
Here they recommend in adults and even in children, the uh, intravenous uh, ceftriaxone for two to four weeks is indicated. Alternative options are here, you can read. But response is very slow and it may be incomplete in many cases. Same applies for children, ceftriaxone can be used. But I will not go much, I will not go into details of other treatment options in terms of antibiotics, but I will just summarize them here. Oral antibiotics are needed or indicated for early disseminated phase, early uh, Lyme disease phases that we talked about, and IV antibiotics are indicated for neurological symptoms, symptomatic cardiac disease, and refractory Lyme arthritis. So this is a basic overview of uh, antibiotic treatment for Lyme disease. Now, how do you treat the psychiatric comorbidities here? I was more interested in this topic when I started this uh, preparing this lecture, but unfortunately the, there are not many studies specifically talking about this topic. So what I found is that first, there are no FDA approved medication for treating psychiatric comorbidities. And one study said this, which I felt was very interesting, helpful, but maybe controversial. So they say if somebody is only on antibiotic treatment, having a psychiatric comorbidities or psychiatric uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms, you can treat those symptoms with psychotropics targeting those symptoms. This makes more sense. The second thing they said is, if a person is only on psychotropics and they're not adequately responding, you can consider treating the symptoms with antibiotics. Here I will say collaboration with appropriate uh, specialities is indicated. I will not start these treatment, but will work in collaboration with other providers here. And one thing I will say is this, what is not recommended first and most important is long-term antibiotic therapy is not recommended. And I also found other recommendation by ISDA. There, there's a big list. These are the antibiotics not recommended uh, for Lyme's disease treatment, anti-Bartonella therapies are not indicated for Lyme disease treatment, hyperbaric oxygen, ozone, fever therapy. It's interesting that people, they, there are treatment done like these. There are clinics who target these treatments. The um, Infectious Disease Society of America do not recommend these. They don't recommend IV immunoglobulins, IV hydrogen peroxide, or specific nutrition supplements. But most important is this, long-term antibiotic therapy is not indicated. So, I will end our discussion on this topic. Please tell me if this was helpful, but uh, I will end this session by saying the thing that I started this session with, which is, a, pre a psychiatrist working in an endemic area where there is high risk of having Lyme disease should have Lyme disease in their differential diagnosis for any atypical psychiatric presentation. So thank you friends again. I'm Dr. Harvinder Singh. This is my email. This is the website that I work on and the course that I created, Psychiat Physician's Guide for Clinical Psychiatry. Please consider joining us if you like this um, video. Looking forward uh, to our next um, video podcast. I'll see you all there. Thank you, have a good day. Take care, bye.